remember the commemoration of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, it's a topic that still resonates today because it hasn't uh, uh, it hasn't been solved in the sense that there are still parties that either deny it or that find a roundabout way to uh, to brush it off. And obviously the people who are affected by this, not only Armenians, but also uh, Pontic Greeks, Assyrians, uh, these communities have been traumatized. The trauma has been passed down throughout uh, the new, new generations and newer generations. So it's a, it's a topic that not only is just as important today as it was 50 years ago or the year you know right after uh, it ended because the, the, the dates that are given for the Armenian Genocide it's not just one or two years it goes into the 1920s, the early 1920s um, so it was a, a major event not only for the 20th century but also uh, for our Armenian history and Armenian history is nearly 4,000 years old and there isn't really an Armenian family that hasn't been affected, that hasn't been impacted by the genocide in one way or another. So it's a topic that will continue to resonate until a, a just resolution is found. And first and foremost, that's Turkey recognizing that it was genocide. And from recognition, we would then move on to restitution and reparations. And we'll be talking about that topic uh, in one of the panels later on. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. But uh, there I did say it was tragic, and indeed it was, but on the, if, we, if there's a silver lining to be found, it's that Armenians are here, Assyrians are here, Greeks are here. So like a phoenix, they've risen, they're prospering in whatever communities that you find them in, whether it's in the homeland, in Armenia, Greece, or uh, the trip, well, Assyrians not so much with uh, what's going on now in the Near East, but um, we're still here. And it's a topic that will continue to push forward. It's a topic that we'll continue to advocate for and educate others and seek justice for. Also, um, one thing that I like to emphasize, is specifically in Armenia's case, is that the genocide happened in a period when Armenia hadn't had statehood for nearly 600 years. And soon after, it had statehood very briefly. Then the Soviets, uh, the Bolsheviks, took over, and only in 1991, with the collapse of the USSR, the Armenia again regained its independence. Why I bring this up is because, uh, more so than recognition, reparations, and all that, which obviously is very important, Armenians, both in the diaspora and in Armenia, need to focus on nation building. Why? To prevent a future genocide from ever occurring again. And a great example of this is the modern state of Israel, which took their genocide so seriously that they beefed up their military to the point that they are the supreme power in the Near East. They have nuclear weapons, which they don't confirm, but uh, it's, it's well known. So the point that I'm trying to make is that if you make a country, specifically in this case Armenia, strong enough, you don't have to worry about others picking on you. You don't have to ask for the so-called great powers to protect you. Ultimately, you can protect yourself. You know, it's instead of going to your big brother to help with the schoolyard bully, you've got the tools now to take care of the schoolyard bully. So that's the that's the metaphor that I would like to use. And finally, just a, a last anecdotal. Um, uh, Piece. Uh, the other day I was having a conversation with a, a good friend of mine and we were uh, we just came on the topic of uh, St. Jude. And uh, some of you may know St. Jude along with uh, St. Bartholomew are the patron saints of Armenia. Uh, according to Armenian church tradition, they brought Christianity to Armenia. So therefore they're counted as the patron saints. Uh, St. Jude is also uh, the saint of so-called lost causes or desperate cases. Um, but not of hopelessness. So this is important to remember because while what I mentioned is a long-term process, nation building, whatever country we're talking about, we've, we've seen this uh, more recently in the Middle East. It doesn't take one year, it certainly doesn't take one generation either. It's a long process, but it's not hopeless. Uh, there, 
there is light at the end of the tunnel. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stanton. Instead of introducing our speakers as far as uh, what they've done, where they come from, all that, I'll allow our speakers to let us know whatever they think is the most important uh, piece of their biography, and then you can start with your presentation. So, Dr. Stanton, please. pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm um, the president of Genocide Watch and founder of it, which was the first uh, global NGO devoted for to preventing and stopping genocide and punishing genocide around the world, and also the founder of the uh, Alliance Against Genocide, which is, was also the first international coalition uh, to do this. Since then, the anti-genocide movement has grown tremendously. Uh, when I realized we needed this was when I was in the State Department. And um, I had written the uh, UN resolutions to create the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and also uh, was working toward a criminal tribunal for Cambodia, where I had lived in 1980. And I'd also lived in Rwanda uh, before the genocide, and then became uh, our representative to the tribunal for the first couple of years when it was having lots of startup problems. Um, so that's how I realized that there was there were no organizations out there specifically devoted to all of the world's genocides. There were specific, of course, organizations devoted to particular genocides. Uh, the Holocaust and uh, the Armenian Genocide and so forth. But to see the fact that genocide is a common phenomenon among many, many nations, and that in fact it has a structure, a process that is common to nearly all genocides that I have studied, uh, was really important to the development of genocide theory. Uh, I think I'm probably best known for um, a memo I circulated in the State Department. I think it's the most widely read memo <laughs> ever in the State Department. Uh, that is called The Eight Stages of Genocide. Uh, since the time I wrote it in 1996, and I wrote it because I realized after going around and talking to diplomats who had basically dropped the ball on the Rwandan genocide. It was worse than dropping the ball, in fact. I think we were criminally negligent during the Rwandan genocide. Uh, I just realized that most diplomats, have, you know, weren't law school graduates. They didn't really know what genocide is. And also, certainly didn't know what the process that leads up to genocide is. Whereas I'm a structural anthropologist as well as an uh, international lawyer. So I think in terms of processes, and what I realized was that there was a common structure to uh, genocide. Uh, in very quick and dirty kind of uh, uh, order, first there's classification, then there's symbolization, um, then there is discrimination, then there is dehumanization, then there is organization, uh, then there is polarization, then there is preparation by the perpetrators, arms and you know, planning and all the other things. Then there is persecution uh, of the victim group. And finally, there is the genocide, the actual extermination. Uh, and I wrote that as seven stages first, until I realized that there is a final stage that I hadn't included in my original uh, memo, and that is denial. Denial happens in every single genocide. It begins at the beginning of the genocide and it carries long after the genocide. And probably the best case of it that I know of, in fact, is the Turkish denial of the Armenian, Pontic Greek, and Assyrian genocide and other, uh, the, the, the massacre of other Christians under the uh, CUP regime. Uh, 
And so that is a battle I've been fighting for quite some time because when I realized that denial was one of our biggest problems, uh, it, was, it became one of the themes of my presidency of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. And I wrote many letters to Prime Minister Erdogan of uh, Turkey about this. Uh, we developed a correspondence, in fact, and I actually got letters back. Um, I basically was arguing with him, saying, you know, you didn't do this genocide. You didn't commit it. Your government didn't do it. Why don't you do as Germany now has, recognize what a former benighted government did in, you know, the Ottoman Empire, face up to it, say, yes, our ancestors did this and we are very sorry about it and we want to make amends. Well, of course, he wrote back, and you'll see this in one of the slides, it's really very cogent, I thought. He said, you know, you as an American had no place telling us that we committed genocide when you committed genocide against your own Native Americans. And I had this, I totally agree with him. In fact, I wrote him back a letter and I said, I think you're right, actually. Uh, I wish our Congress would apologize to our Native Americans and, for that matter, make reparations to them for the genocides that we white people in the United States uh, committed in the name of manifest destiny. We had this crazy idea that somehow because, you know, God had given us this land, we had the right to take it away from the people who actually were the owners of it. Uh, and not only just take it away, but also kill most of them off. At the time when uh, my ancestors got off the Mayflower, yes, one of my ancestors actually got off the Mayflower uh, uh, and um, then settled in Massachusetts Bay and then in Virginia and so forth, uh, there were three million Native Americans in what is now the continental United States. There were probably over 10 million in all of the Americas. By 1890, there were only eight, there were only 290,000 left in the continental United States. Now, if that is not genocide, I don't know what is. And yet, not a single bill has ever gotten out of committee to apologize for that to our Native American populations. When I was originally asked to speak to this morning, I was asked to speak on three genocides. Uh, <laughs> comparing, basically, the tactics of denial in each of these genocides. And I can certainly do that if I had the time, but I don't. Uh, they told me I only had half an hour to speak, and so what I decided to do, instead of speaking on the Armenian Genocide, the Rwandan Genocide, and the Native American Genocide, and showing you that, in fact, the, the tactics of denial are the same for every single one of them, with quotes, you know, from leaders, uh, and so forth. I decided instead to focus on the main genocide we're interested in today, the Armenian Genocide. So that's the only one that I'm going to show you quotes from. Uh, there is a bigger PowerPoint that will be on the genocidewatch.net website. That's our website for Genocide Watch. That's the organization I run. Uh, that includes these others as well. And so you can look it up. Uh, so, let's begin, first of all, uh, with what, why denial is so terrible. It occurs during and after genocide, that's we know. But it actually triples the probability of further genocide in the same place, in the same country, when there is impunity, when no one's been punished for it. This is uh, according to Dr. Barbara Harf, who's a political uh, scientist who taught at Annapolis for a long time. She's done statistical studies of this. Uh, it also extends the crime of genocide to future generations of victims. We talk, you talked about um, how trauma is passed on from generation to generation, and that is very true. Uh, it also is a denial of their right to exist as a people in many ways. So that in that sense, it is a continuing destruction of uh, the group. Uh, and it is a continuation of the intent to destroy the group. Um, and then, and this is 
a point I made uh, in a lecture I gave uh, last week over at George Washington University Law School. I believe it is actually a violation of the Genocide Convention itself because I think that denial is a form of incitement and also a form of complicity in future genocides. And both of those are crimes under the Genocide Convention. You don't have to wait for genocide to actually occur before you can actually take somebody to court and charge them with incitement to commit genocide or complicity. Uh, so the tactics are predictable, and that's what we're going to go through quickly, I hope, today. First of all, you attack the truth tellers. And here is an example. This is good old Justin McCarthy, one of our favorite deniers, uh, definitely in the pay of the Turkish government. Uh, and he's just saying, look, you know, you're anti-Muslim. And the American missionaries uh, were liars. And uh, the Allied powers were propagandists. So we can't believe any of this uh, about the Armenian genocide. Um, you also attack the truth tellers like me by saying, look, and this is a quote from one of Prime Minister Erdogan's letters to me. Americans are in no position to accuse Turkey of genocide after the genocide the U.S. has committed against its Native Americans. In other words, it's a kind of a moral, uh, clean hands doctrine, really. Uh, and there's a, there's a point to be made there, I have to say. I think one of the first jobs of international lawyers, in fact, is to analyze their own uh, sins, if you will, their own prejudices, their own uh, slants, their own biases, before they go on to, uh, you know, make pronouncements about what should happen in other countries. So, uh, the second tactic is to minimize the deaths. Now here we've got good old Justin McCarthy again saying, you know, it really wasn't uh, 1.5 or 2 million, it was only 600,000. That still sounds like genocide to me, doesn't it to you? Uh, I actually challenged Jerry Rubin at a, uh, when he gave a speech, he was an anti-war activist. I was very opposed to the Vietnam War because I thought it was so misguided. Uh, and uh, how we ever get, managed to get ourselves in the position of the French colonialists in, in China is something that still boggles my mind. But anyway, um, I actually challenged him. I said, you know, I put up my hand. I was a law, law professor there at Washington and Lee at the time, and I said, you know, Jerry, isn't it time for us who are in the anti-war movement to admit we were wrong about Cambodia? The bloodbath did happen. Uh, the Khmer Rouge killed two million out of eight, eight million people, a quarter of their own population. And his response was, oh, no, it wasn't two million. It was only 700,000. And this gasp goes through the audience. You know, I didn't have to respond. In fact, I just sat down. Apparently, somebody actually punched him out at a bar later that evening. But I, I don't recommend that. I really just don't agree with that kind of approach. But anyway, here's another thing. is to destroy the evidence. That's the third tactic. You uh, very well know what the uh, Turks uh, did to the Armenians. They threw their bodies into uh, the Black Sea or the Tigris River. They pushed them over cliffs. Uh, you know, this is well known. It was actually uh, documented by American consuls who were out there and saw it. Uh, so let's uh, show another evidence, another way in which you can destroy the evidence. Go ahead to the next one. You destroy the archives. Uh, and you block access to them until you purge them. And we've got strong evidence here. This is a Turk who has said this. Halil Burktai, who's an honest historian, who says, said, yep, uh, there have been two efforts to purge the archives, and we know that. And again, we have another witness uh, who has, uh, is a witness to the uh, purging of the archives and destruction. Go ahead. Um, the fourth tactic is to kill or intimidate the witnesses. Um, we all know about good old Turkish criminal code article 301 and how it made it a crime to even refer to the Armenian genocide. It was when they tried to charge Orhan Pamuk, who won the Nobel Prize with this crime, that the Turks really kind of backed off. 
they realize, wait a minute, you know, this criminal code article, uh, which has been used already to prosecute, imprison, and torture a lot of people, maybe we sh can't get away with that with this guy, with this Nobel Prize winner. So they eventually drop charges against him, but they're still using this basic technique. Uh, it's still uh, not allowed to really talk about it. And Harant Dink, of course, was murdered. He was a courageous uh, publisher who was willing to uh, uh, publish, and he was, they just killed him. Uh, now, Professor Tanner Acham, who's a Turk and a, a re very respectable uh, genocide scholar, one of my good friends, he's on their death list. Uh, so, kill the witnesses. Uh, tactic five is to claim the victims died of natural causes. You know, it was a famine, or they were just, it was a migration, you know, and then some of them died of disease, and it was all too bad, you know, and so forth and so on. And so here we've got a, a statement uh, of exactly that. Uh, you just can't say it was genocide. You know, they did have hardships on the journey, and it was really too bad, you know. Uh, we hear a lot of that from the Magista regime in Ethiopia during their famine, so-called famine, uh, which was genocide, actually. Um, and again, we have here um, a, uh, a, an argument for what could be called uh, forced displacement or ethnic cleansing. Uh, by the way, a term invented by Slobodan Milosevic and that has somehow managed to creep its way into international uh, legal talk. I'd like to ab abolish it because it's what we're talking about, in fact, is forced displacement, which is a crime against humanity. But this is what he's saying. He says, look, no, it wasn't genocide. We were just trying to move them. Go okay, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and then, get this. This is really quite outrageous. Uh, you deny that the dis deportees were mistreated at all. You, you say, oh, well, no, we gave them food, we brought them water, protection, shelter. Oh, my gosh, no. We, we were really trying to protect them, you know. Uh, well, that is simply a lie. And, you know, when you see a lie like that, you have to say, that's a lie, sir. Uh, uh, then we get to um, yet the next one. I don't know why it's, it's kind of gotten up above the screen there, but um, maybe we can move it down just a little bit. Uh, the basic argument is this. It's tactic number six, and it was a war, not genocide. That's the basic argument. And it was the problem that our ambassador in uh, Rwanda had with uh, the Rwandan genocide. He couldn't ever figure out the fact that what was happening in Rwanda was not a civil war at all, that it was a civil war, but it was also genocide. He thought that they were mutually exclusive, and i still not right, but maybe you can fix it. Uh, a thinner notebook would do it. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, there we go. Thanks. Uh, that's perfect. Uh, so here we have, this one is a big one that the Armenians were disloyal insurgents in World War I, and they were a fifth column. And so they had to somehow be dealt with, well, how did you deal with them? You kill them. Uh, you know, we're not entirely have great clean hands on that one either. Uh, if you'll remember, we interned our Japanese uh, citizens in the United States during World War II, and it was actually upheld by the Supreme Court in possibly one of the worst Supreme Court rulings in all of history. Uh, <coughs> since that time, we've apologized to them, but uh, we at least didn't kill them off. That, that was quite a different approach, I'd say. But here, they actually just decided to kill them. Um, again, tech, another example of Tactic 6, it was war, not genocide. Uh, a civil war within a global war. You see, the problem with this argument is that, in fact, most genocides occur during civil wars or international wars. They are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're coterminous. They actually go together. Um, we have, then, Tactic 7. This was just the result of ancient conflicts, ancient hatreds. We heard this a lot in Bosnia. You know. Nothing we can do about these people. They're always fighting and killing each other. So let's not get involved. My God. You know, and that, they said the same about Rwanda. 
I never forget when I came back to the State Department when the Director General said, you're the only genocide expert we got in the whole Foreign Service. This is when I was a junior officer, you know, just, just uh, in my first assignment. <laughs> she ordered me back to Washington to work on the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide. Uh, but I was a little older than most of the others, which is also why I had a hard time learning Thai at the middle of my 40s. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, you just say, well, no, these Africans, they're always fighting and killing each other, so let's just not get involved. Well, that is really irresponsible. Uh, and this, of course, is one of my favorites, being an international lawyer. Deny that the facts fit the legal definition of genocide. The legal definition, of course, is genocide is the intentional destroy any of the following acts that ha with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group in whole or in part as such. Don't ever forget that in part. A lot of people like to. So here you have somebody who wants to ignore the in part. Uh, and Representative Stephen Solars, who's Jewish, by the way, at the time, uh, you know, and he's no longer uh, with us, but he was opposing that House resolution that's always introduced, saying, you know, we really aren't sure it's a genocide. It's really not quite like the Holocaust. Well, by golly, it was like the Holocaust. Uh, and here's another uh, example of this uh, confusion that Justin McCarthy is using. He's saying, look, they didn't try to kill them all. Uh, there were plenty of Armenians still left in uh, Istanbul and other major cities, and so and they they're still there. In fact, some of them, and so they couldn't. It couldn't have been a genocide because the Turkish government did not try to kill them all off. Uh, you know, this same mistake was made by um, Justice uh, Kasese when he headed up the UN Commission of Inquiry to Darfur. Uh, he came back with this conclusion: the Sudanese government was not. Uh, culpable for genocide because it, he said after all they're letting some of the four and the Masalit and these other tribes stay alive so how could it be genocide well that is of course absolutely ignorant of the basic premise in the genocide convention that you don't have to kill a whole group so go ahead uh, here's again one you know the G word is this kind of uh, nuclear weapon of, of uh, human rights law, really. So avoid it. Uh, Justin McCarthy says, no, no, let, let's not call it that. We'll just call it a human disaster. You know, okay. You know, something like that. But not the G word, for God's sake. We had exactly the same attitude in our own State Department during the Rwanda genocide for three months. When everybody else knew it was a genocide, even Joyce Leader, who was our deputy chief of mission in Rwanda, began calling it a genocide on the very first day of the genocide in Rwanda. Um, and yet, the lawyers in our State Department, who I frankly think were committing legal malpractice, uh, I'm not claiming they should be disbarred or anything, you know, you can make mistakes, but uh, they said, look, we don't have enough evidence of specific intent. Well, the question, of course, is how many bodies do you need before you can say that there was specific intent? Uh, so uh, they refused for three months to call a genocide in Rwanda. And you probably have seen that famous interview in which the poor spokesman for the Senate, uh, spokeswoman for the State Department, Christine Shelley, was asked. She said, well, we, have, we, we can say that there are acts of genocide being committed in Rwanda. And a reporter puts up his hand and says, uh, Michelle, how many acts of genocide does it take uh, to make a genocide? And she said, well, I'm just not prepared to answer that question. And of course, I really have to feel for her, because I have been in the State Department, and I know she was reading from a script. It has to be cleared, you know, by everybody. And so she couldn't go beyond that. Well, Warren Christopher just swept it all away. He is a lawyer a few days later and said, look, acts of genocide are genocide. That's how genocide, in fact, is defined in the convention. Okay, <coughs> let's go on to hear another one. This is, a, this is a favorite one of the Turks, too. Look, the word genocide didn't exist in 1915, so how can it apply to the Armenian genocide, you know? Um, 
And here's a good example by a denialist. He was writing for the Institute of Historical Review. Um, he was actually denying the Holocaust in his book. But uh, in, in this one, he's actually claiming the Genocide Convention was a Zionist plot. Of course. Um, and, uh, you know, so it really can't be applied. Uh, of course, he didn't want it to apply it to anything. But uh, we now at least have made it into real law. So go ahead. Okay, here's another one for the lawyers. Because if you can prove there was no intent, then you have disproved genocide. So, deny central planning. Um, and therefore, you can say, look, there really wasn't a genocide here. And here we have an example of uh, an uh, actual American who's, uh, you know, uh, complaining to U.S. Admiral Mark Bristol, who was not at all, uh, not at all uh, in favor of the Armenians, in 1921, he was trying to get along with the new uh, Turkish government. And then we also have Gunter Louis, who was another denier, uh, saying, we don't have any authentic documentary evidence existing to prove the culpability of the central government of Turkey for the massacres of 1915. Folks, that is another lie. I mean, they held trials in 1919 in which so much evidence was produced that they actually had death sentences against the top three leaders of the CUP. Uh, I mean, they were sure they were in absentia, but they produced an enormous quantity of evidence that this was centrally planned. And we now know from a lot of other research. Now, this is another one, of course, very closely related, against central planning. It's what I call the anarchy defense. It's all part of Tactic 9. You say most of the murders were actually committed by Kurdish bandits. You know, they were just trying to, uh, they were trying to move them. They're trying to deport them, put them on trains down to Dare, uh, El Zor, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, and so some died from starvation and thirst. That was really too bad. Uh, but Justin McCarthy says, you know, but many were transported by train. You know, it was very humane. And uh, there was also a massive relief effort by Near East Relief, saved many thousands. Uh, and the government didn't do anything, the Ottoman government didn't do anything to prevent that kind of relief. So, that's really strong evidence that there could not have been genocidal intent. Give me a break. A million more people killed and there was no genocidal intent? Well, here are the leaders. If you think there was no central planning, we know who they were. Here is Talat. And then we go on to, of course, Enver. They were really the two main leaders. Of course, there was another one of the Pashas who also was very much involved in the uh, genocide. But Enver, especially because he was the defense chief, as soon as he became defense chief, he disarmed the Armenians who were part of the uh, Ottoman army, assigned them to labor battalions, and then murdered them. Watch out for your Second Amendment rights is one of the things I would, I would add add on this one. I'm not a gun nut, but I really understand now why having uh, arms is, is an important defense against genocide. But here's a, another good example of central government planning. Look, we have a public execution in a, in, in a public square. Go ahead. Uh, and here's the uh, forced deportation of Armenians in our put. This is a photo by a German businessman. Go ahead. Uh, and here's a photo taken uh, as these are women and children walking into the Syrian desert in 1915. I mean, do these look like revolutionaries to you? I don't think so. Here they are, finally in a camp. And here we get one the Turkish government just loves. Blame the victims. Many Muslim Turks also died during World War I, and the Armenians killed them. Folks, that is called the big lie. The answer is that, sure, there were Muslims and Turks who died in World War I, but the fact is they were not killed by Armenians. They were mostly killed by Allied troops. And so, you know, the fact that there were defense movements by some groups of Armenians is really uh, only a minor part of World War I compared to the rest of the 
uh, attacks on Turkish uh, troops. So, and again, we have another example of the big lie. Um, let's not focus on the uh, Armenians. After all, 2.5 million Turkish and non-Christian people also died during World War I. Again, it's a big lie because the whole point is it wasn't the Armenians who killed them. So go ahead. And I ask you this, were these Armenian orphans revolutionaries? I don't think so. Were these? Was this child an Armenian revolutionary? He was murdered. Or this baby who died? And then, of course, if you do bring up the, the trials in 1919, you simply say, even international trials are one-sided. So, you can't trust them. The Turkish government says the Armenians were never put on trial for their atrocities against Turks, whereas the young Turk leaders were tried in absentia and unfairly in 1919. So you can't even trust what happened in the trials. And then we get to the ace in the hole. This is the big one, folks. Tactic 12. Don't jeopardize U.S.-Turkish relations. You wonder why no resolution has ever passed Congress? Well, here it is. Uh, look to the future, not to the past. And here is a direct quote from a letter from four former secretaries of state in an open letter to the U.S. Congress opposing the resolution recognizing the Armenian genocide. And this kind of letter is repeated every year. Uh, and these, these are secretaries of state from both parties. Madeleine Albright signed one of these things, saying, look, don't jeopardize our relations. They're our strategic partner. And here we have another, this is a, just sort of another riff on that, tactic 12. Uh, this sort of explains the context. In World War I, we, President Wilson really didn't want to get involved in the war and realized that if we went in with troops, it would have been an act of war against one of the uh, combatants in the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire in the war. Would have gotten us involved in war. And he ran on the ticket. He st kept us out of war for his second, uh, for his re-election. And here we have a fact that since that, since the Armenian Genocide, no resolution has ever gotten to a vote in Congress calling the Armenian Genocide a genocide. Sometimes it has actually gotten out of committee. I remember one year it got out of committee. But they never called it up for a vote. Somehow they got to Nancy Pelosi and killed it. And again, despite his pre-election you know, uh, statements, pre even President Obama in his proclamations has never called the Armenian Genocide a genocide to this day. It's about time, I think. He ought to feel a little bit free now. He doesn't have to run for re-election. Uh, this is Tanner Acham's actual explanation for why he's, he thinks uh, Turkey has such a hard time recognizing this genocide. He thinks it has to do with the constitution of the modern Turkish state and with the identity of the modern Turkish state. And I think he's really on to something there. Um, that if Turkey were to admit that it was born in genocide, that it would be a real insult to Turks to admit that their ancestors committed genocide. Well, folks, I think we could say the same thing about our treatment of Native Americans. The whole idea of, Native, of manifest destiny is still very much alive in the United States. And if we were to admit that our country was founded on a genocidal ideology, can you imagine what that would make a lot of Americans feel like? But we should admit it. And we should apologize for it. Just as we now apologize for slavery, which was part of our own constitution, our founding fathers owned slaves. I think he was really onto there, onto the right thing. And here we finally, this is the eighth, this is the real big one. Don't jeopardize U.S.-Turkish relations. After all, they are a key member of NATO. They have in Cyrillic their other NATO bases there. If this resolution passes, then the Turkish Grand National Assembly will have to 
evaluate the extension of the use of those bases. I think you've got it there. So I've just got a few suggestions about, you know, how do you approach defeating denial? That's a very slow process sometimes. You should, of course, try to arrest and try the perpetrators of genocide. That's why I've been so in favor of international tribunals or mixed tribunals right after the <coughs> genocide so that you can really gather the evidence so that nobody can say, hey, it didn't happen. But you know what? In Rwanda, they're still saying it in spite of over 17 convictions now for genocide by the ICTR. You tr create truth commissions to document the facts. Well, goodness knows, those commissions have been created. I mean, there is unanimity, in fact, in the International Association of Genocide Scholars that this was genocide. We passed a resolution unanimously. Now, that never happens in the IAGS, uh, that the Armenian genocide was genocide. Uh, you hold public truth and reconciliation forums in the country where the crimes were committed. That's going to be hard because they've actually just done a poll in Turkey and only 9% of Turks believe that uh, genocide was committed against the Armenians. So we've got a lot of education to do here. And I believe one of the keys to that is to incorporate education about genocide, not just in Turkey, but all around the world. So they realize this is not you know, just their problem. It is a human problem. It is based on the fact that we are ethnocentric. And we have all, in our past, some of our ancestors have probably participated in or been victims of genocide. We should make films and radio programs for the public. Uh, I can't wait until they make the film about Musadek. Uh, I think it's time. And finally, never let the big lie of denial go unchallenged. Anytime you hear it. So, the family finally this is a picture of, uh, of a graveyard. This actually graveyard was in, is in Rwanda. But as you know, uh, there are now memorials too in uh, Anatolia, in, in Turkey, uh, to the victims. Uh, so I think we should all uh, have a moment of silence for all of those people who died. Thank you very much. I planned it so there would actually be time to discuss, talk, whatever, because I didn't want to just fill up the time, but we should have our second speaker probably and then do that. We'll do Q&A after Dr. Hodakiewicz presents. So thank you for that great presentation, Dr. Stanton. Next we have Dr. Hodakiewicz. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm going to have the speakers uh, describe their bio, what they think is important. So when you're up here, you can, you can say what you like or what you don't like. Um, but anyway, Dr. Hodakiewicz is the, the chair of, he holds the chair of the Krzysztof Chair in Polish Studies, um, but he's also a recognized expert and genocide, mass atrocities, um, nationalism, Eastern European history. Uh, so he's got uh, his own take on the Armenian genocide and the concept of genocide. And with, for, without further ado, uh, Dr. Rodakiewicz. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome at the Institute of World Politics. Thank you for being here. Thank you for observing a moment of silence. That's what I was going to do first for my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, today is my uh, uncle's 90th birthday, but uh, Villian in New York. Um, Villian asked me to speak about the Armenians long before my family decided that we were going to have a celebration in New York. My uncle is a professor emeritus at, uh, at Columbia University, a professor of economics. One day, about 45 years ago, when he was in Turkey, he decided to roam around. And then he was arrested. 
He had no idea why. Uh, but the Turkish government at the time thought he was on a mission to find Armenian graves. He was just in the wrong place. He was, of course, very shocked. He had heard about uh, uh, the, the Armenian massacres, uh, but uh, he didn't expect that so long, almost 50 years after, he'd get in trouble. So I will, when I see him, he's frail, I will tell him about this, this conference and this attempt to understand, to commemorate. Uh, I deal with mass murder quite frequently because here at the Institute we teach mass murder prevention uh, using all tools of statecraft. One of the most important weapons we have in our arsenal is to identify and name a mass murder. What is it? Well for me, first of all, the Armenian tragedy is a sin crying to heavens for vengeance. Not only a horrible crime was committed, but there has been, but there has been no contrition to speak of. This answers one question. What happened? But the matter is not closed. Christian understanding of the horror is not enough for scholarly and legal reasons. We have usually referred to the Armenian tragedy as genocide. This concept is inadequate for it's not commodious enough to convey the scale of the horror and its driving forces. Clarity is sorely needed when talking about the Armenian tragedy, which was the portent of the horrors of the 20th century and initially served as our paradigm to understand mass murder with a view to reconceptualize the catastrophe, to accommodate a multitude of factors and narrations, we shall ask why, who, and how, and we shall also elaborate more on what happened. To be sure, mass murder is nihil novis subsole. It's been around forever. In the antiquity, the Assyrians pursued wholesale slaughter as state policy in fertile in the Fertile Crescent, whoever opposed them died. No footnotes. The extermination of the inhabitants of Jericho, identified by their gens, is only the first example of killing of a people in the Bible. Of course, the killing of the worshippers of the golden calf in the desert is the first political purge reported in the Old Testament by Moses. Was it genocide? Was it self-genocide? Apparently that is a problem. Uh, the list of perpetrators and victims in history is nauseating. There is a book, Blood and Soil, A World History of Genocide and Extermination from Sparta to Darfur. It's just one example. It is a woefully flawed one for uh, the author likes to select politically correct massacres by imperialist, racists, and colonialists while depicting the other solely as victims and dismissing human nature in favor of postmodernist musings. Yet it is a chronicle of, of horrors. If it started with the Assyrians in recorded history, and I'm sure nomadic tribes exterminated one another with a gusto, then why should we start with the Armenians? In the 20th century, the Herero people were the first to go under the knife, wholesale, in Germany's southwest Africa. The Hereros rebelled, they were suppressed, rounded up, chased into the desert, and prevented from returning to civilization. Some were shot. Uh, for attempting to break through, most perished of thirst, hunger, and exposure. Mm -hmm. Hermann Goering's father presided over the slaughter. <laughs> but this horrific mm -hmm. extirpation receded into history. Fortunately, the opposite is true about the Armenians. We know and remember much more, mainly thanks to the victims themselves. 
The perpetrators, however, first denied the mass murder by pretending it had never happened, and now they denied by relativizing the crime in congruence with the spirit of the times. Now, who were the perpetrators of the Armenian tragedy? Generally, they were Ottoman subjects. At the helm, there was the decreasingly relevant and rapidly diminishing old elite of the sublime port. Only in the remotest corners of the empire, where the old relationship of submission had not been violated by modernity, there remained a few exceptional chieftains and sheiks who took their lordly duties vis-à-vis -vis the Armenians and everybody else seriously and protected them throughout the carnage. The ancient reactionaries simply had no idea what the heck was going on. So they refused to kill. But this was a complete exception. Both at the periphery and at the center, the old guard was being overshadowed by Turkish folk nationalists or ethno-nationalists. Although largely secular, these radical young Turks stressed the Muslim religion as well as common Turkish folk heritage and language as a binding element of their project. Yet they were also capable of working with various post-Ottoman people so long as they were Muslims, Kurds, Azer Azeris, and others. The perpetrators were soldiers, paramilitaries, auxiliaries, policemen, bureaucrats, and assorted civilian opportunists. Soon, the logic of modern nationalism would set the perpetrators at their loggerheads, but not before the Christians, chiefly Armenians, and the Greeks and Assyrians were taken care of. It is important to understand that not everyone was slated for extermination. Women who were willing to submit to their tormentors were sometimes spared at the price of conversion and sexual degradation. Children slated for Turkification and Islamization could live as well, often robbed of their identity. More specifically, who were the victims? They were the Armenians, both conscious and unconscious. All were perceived as Armenians by the outside world. Probably most of the victims had an Armenian sense of uh, identity. But they were also Christians, <coughs> most of them Orthodox. Some Armenian Catholics were in communion with Rome. A few were Protestants. One can assume that most had a religious sense of understanding themselves, but also a historical one as heirs to Christendom's eldest kingdom. One can speculate that most may have had, therefore, a pre-modern sense of nationality or ethnicity rather than a modern, constructed, ideological one. Their identity as Christian Armenians set them apart from their Muslim, Turkish, Kurdish, Azeri, and Arab surroundings. In addition, there was, a, uh, there was the legal dimension of inequality. The Armenians were ostensibly the Dimi. The Dimi, ironically, means the protected people. At the same time, in the realm of the sublime port, they knew their place. Within and without their curia, the Armenian curia, they were still subject to the scourge of the Sharia and the whims of the caliphate. Their archaic legal status was infused with modern legal meaning as the Ottoman Empire experimented with constitutionalism. Ostensibly, in theory, the Armenians became equal before secular law. In practice, this was largely ignored, and any attempt to invoke constitutionalism infuriated the Turkish master. Because Turkey, on one hand, wanted to modernize, on the other hand, it wanted to remain Turkey. The whole legal system thus, both old and new, only served to solidify the separation and self-separation of the Armenians within the Ottoman body politics. It also cut them off from the majority adherents of modern folk nationalism that emerged in the empire in the second half of the 19th century. Further, they were perceived not only as traditionally lowly Armenian Christian Dinis and modern nationalist aliens, but also as an object of envy. 
And envy is mediocrity craving success. It can't have. After all, some Armenians were successful in business, trade, finance, industry, agriculture, professions, crafts, and arts. Their success was projected at the Armenian community at large. It fanned the flames of resentment and hatred. The Armenians did not deserve their success because they did not deserve to re reap the benefits of living in the realm that hosted them as they were unworthy. This somewhat circular and self-contradictory proposition applied equally to the, historical, to the historical Armenian domicile and to relatively new centers of the Armenian settlement. They did not deserve success and prosperity, whether rural or urban. Thus, there was also a spatial dimension <laughs> to the anti-Armenian animus. The political factor reflected in a conviction that uh, anything the Armenians demanded was uppity, presumptuous, treasonous, and sometimes terroristic and revolutionary. True. The Armenians were unhappy with their status in the Ottoman Empire. They tried to alleviate it. A few even turned to revolution and terrorism to the detriment of the majority of their community. As we see, multifarious poisonous factors negatively impacted the lot of the Armenians. But no single cause, not even Armenian terrorism, was the reason for the mass murder. It was, rather, the decline, disintegration, and finally collapse of the Ottoman polity and the birth pangs of a new Turkish order. This massively monstrous process brought about mass, mass death that astounded humanity. For it was the Armenian tragedy that entered into collective consciousness of the world's elite, in particular in the West as a ruthless crime that required a category of its own. This arduous process of communicating and absorbing the horrible required a radical agent to be triggered. Armenia was not liberated. The burial grounds were ensconced in inaccessible territory. The survivors were traumatized and scattered. The witnesses were mostly silent. And the perpetrators were in denial. Yet. The Armenian tragedy did enter our consciousness rather early, unlike the Holocaust, because an Armenian nationalist assassinated one of the perpetrators in the West, more precisely in Berlin, in the 1920s. During his cathartic tra trial, public opinion was exposed to the horrors of what had transpired a few years prior. First Germany, then Europe, next the United States, and finally the rest of the world. The astonished public learned about the morbid progress of mega-death. Only a few Armenians resisted, arms in hand. I'm a nut. The bulk of them was killed in an astonishing variety of ways. Many of the able-bodied males died in a rather orderly and premeditated fashion. In particular, the community leaders and the draftees in the Ottoman military perished in well-organized shootings. Elsewhere, savage primordial chaos of mass murder replaced the apparent order of modern executions. The rest of the Armenian people, including elderly women and children, were driven into the wilderness, exposed to the elements in the mountains and deserts, starved to death and denied water. Some were isolated in makeshift camps or herded in forced marches where they sometimes perished of diseases and exhaustion. Most were shot, bayoneted, stabbed, slashed, burned, impaled, mutilated, tortured, beaten to death, buried alive, and driven off the cliffs. Before they were dispatched, they were routinely despoiled. Their estate was confiscated. They were forced to make contribution to their captors. Their households were looted and their personal belongings were stolen from them. This was one of the greatest thefts in the 20th century, soon to be overshadowed first by Nazi Germany, in, part in particular as far as the Holocaust of the Jews, and of course by the total extermination and expropriation of the communist revolution. But the Armenians were the first. Whether or not there was a comprehensive plan or a central order given to murder the Armenians, very few survived. 
there has been no contrition, no reconciliation, no restitution. The Armenians wield the most powerful weapon available to the victim. Memory. They remember the Hayot Tsehas Panuitiun. That's how it's pronounced. But they are scared others will forget. Hence we can see an occasional tug of war between Armenian and Jewish scholars. The former attempt to translate the Armenian tragedy into the framework of the Holocaust of the Jews. The latter endeavor to defend the idea of the uniqueness of the Shoah, which nowadays serves as the Iridium Platinum standard for our understanding of mass murder, or more precisely, genocide. The conceptualization of the Holocaust as the paradigm for mass extermination is a new phenomenon, however, dating from the 1960s. Initially, the Armenian portent of the unveiling horrors of the 20th century shocked humanity to such an extent as to command its imagination almost absolutely. There were several reasons. From the vantage point of the 1920s and 30s, the Armenian suffering clearly overshadowed anything else, including even the anti-Jewish pogroms in the Intermarium, the lands between the Black and Baltic Seas. Arguably, the cognizance of the Armenian tragedy continued briefly into the Second World War and its aftermath. Obviously, the horrific fate of Jews, Christian Poles, and other victims of the Third Reich was mirror imaged and even grafted onto the Armenian experience. Also, the public discourse of the time was nationalist. Thus, it preferred conceptualizing both victims and perpetrators in nationalistic terms. Last but not least, other forms of mass murder concerned the communist perpetrators. Progressive intellectuals who dominated the narrative in the West avoided such unpleasant topic, topics. On the other hand, the detractors of the communists usually failed to conceptualize the red extermination actions properly. Most also preferred to resort to the nationalist discourse and referred to the Bolshevik mass slaughter as murder by the Jews, who, of course, as the Canard went, invented communism and controlled the Soviet Union to take over the world. Thus, no all-encompassing narrative of mass murder emerged to do justice to the Armenians or anyone else. The most successful narrative, arguably, was Poland's brilliant Jewish lawyer Rafael Lenkin's concept of genocide, the killing of a gens, or nation, ethnicity. His idea clearly stemmed from the mass murder of the Armenians. Lenkin himself admitted he was obsessed with the Armenian tragedy. Lenkin began his work on the legal concept of genocide already in the 1920s and continued furiously into the 1940s. He absolutely based himself on the Armenian predicament. His original Armenian model easily accommodated the murderous actions of Hitler and his minions, as well as such Nazi policies which, while not lethal, Lenkin still subsum subsumed under genocide. Thus, for instance, he included the kidnapping and Germanization of Polish children, as well as looting and fencing of cultural treasures. This was genocide for him. He further saw the murder of the Polish elite as a facet of genocide. Obviously, for him, killing need not embrace the entire people to be classified as genocide. Murdering the elite decapitates the nation. Lenkin could easily relate to those shocking Nazi practices precisely because they were not new. The Armenians were the first to bear their brunt in the 20th century. Yet the concept of genocide is inadequate to express and explain the phenomenon of the Armenian suffering comprehensively. First, it obsesses with the 20th century favorite designation, ethnicity since nationalism was arguably the greatest force and the greatest concern, Lemkin and others concentrated on a narrow definition of mass murder only as it applied to ethnicity. Instead of a multifarious definition and explanation, we received an unvaried narrative, genocide. If it's not genocide, then it didn't happen. Genocide. 
further, second, applying the term genocide interchangeably and synonymously to mass murder tends to imply that the, that the perpetrators not only focus solely on their victim's nationality and nothing else, thus projecting a rather unit, uh, the dimensional picture of the tragedy, but also that this was in essence an aggression of one ethnicity against another one. That's collectivistic. It's sometimes not clear whether the aggressor's unique brand of nationalism was particularly to blame, or was nationalism in general the trigger? What about the nationalism of the victims then? While well, Armenian nationalists feel strongly about themselves, yet they perish, were they to blame? Because they were nationalists? Is nationalism of the victims to blame? And if so, isn't it blaming the victim? What if the victim managed to avenge himself by unleashing genocide against the erstwhile perpetrator? The word genocide is not commodious enough to allow us to appreciate the horror. Third, and most importantly, genocide is a preferred term among those who try to ignore and try to ignore and um, uh, deny the unspeakable crimes committed explicitly for other reasons, for other reasons uh, than uh, ethnicity. Namely, the term genocide excludes or at least obfuscates the mass extermination record of the communists. We have printer problems. In fact, the communists like to harp on the Armenian tragedy, including abusing its memory in their propaganda, precisely because talking about the murder of the Armenians or the pogroms of the Jews deflected the public's attention from the communist crimes. What is the solution so that the truth is told and the victim is properly honored? The most commodious term is democide, killing off people by government for political reason. This has been introduced by R.J. Rummel in his Death by Government. This is flexible enough to account for almost all reasons for mass murder, including genocide. It should, however, be reconceptualized to accommodate mass slaughter by non-state agents. As we see, for instance, both ISIS and Boko Haram are perfectly ca capable of democide. They are also equal opportunity avaricious killers. They murder for no apparent reason at all and for all sorts of reasons. This is exactly what also happened to the Armenians. To call it genocide would be shortchanging, even disrespecting the victims. Their suffering and deaths were comprehensive. So should be our understanding of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hodakevich. So we've got a few minutes for Q&A. Unfortunately, since we started a little bit later, um, we can't take as many questions uh, so that we stay on schedule. But I think we can take a couple. Did we did we put out cards or not? Yes, we did. It's OK. We can just take them. OK. Yeah, for this panel. Uh, you guys then, if you want to choose, just. Sure. Hi, my name is Mike Weber. I'm an alumni from uh, IWB in 2012. Um, I first read Bruce Exposed to Genocide uh, when I was 15, and I read a book called Hearts and Sorrows about uh, spam in the Ukraine. Right? Um, and so, uh, one other thing that I've, I've often read about that particular famine is how there were uh, reporters from some Western um, news agencies who visited the Ukraine during that time and wrote accounts that didn't talk about. The, the true conditions there at all. That's I'm right, Walter curious. Durante from the New York yeah, Times. Tom, yeah. So I'm just curious if you could talk at all about the media's role in, you know, either portraying, covering up famines, and how that affects other people's perceptions of of genocide and how it how it leads to it. It's very important. Uh, I mean, 
one of the reasons that the Rwandan genocide was not acted upon was guess what other things were happening at the same time? The run-up to the, the first South African elections in which majority rule would come into effect in South Africa, so a lot of reporters were down there. Secondly, the great, secondly, the great chase scene with O.J. Simpson <laughs> down the uh, freeways of Los Angeles. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and do you know, they've actually, you know, totaled up how many uh, minutes were on the network TV of these various uh, other events. O.J. Simpson got more than 400 times as much time as the Rwandan genocide. So you're right that the media have a huge uh, impact. I think that one of the things that has helped a lot recently is we have some very, I'd say, far-sighted um, op-ed columnists, um, I think especially of Nick Kristof, uh, and others who really know what a big problem this is. And I must agree with you that the word genocide isn't big enough. In fact, uh, the Soviet Union didn't allow political groups, economic groups, and social groups to be included in the convention. Uh, Raphael Lemkin wanted them included. Uh, and frankly, Genocide Watch doesn't care. We don't get involved in those debates. If there's mass murder, it's good enough for us. Yeah. We will fight like hell against it. And so, you know, we just don't get involved in it. And when the UN spends all this time about talking about Darfur, for example, and trying to decide if it's genocide or not, for three months, while at least 100,000 people are murdered, we think that's a pretty big waste of time for the UN Security Council. And in fact, what we've done is we have uh, drafted an optional protocol to the Genocide Convention that would actually only reassert what already exists in international law. The United for Peace Resolution of 1950 actually says that if the UN Security Council is paralyzed by a Perm 5 veto, as it was in Korea in 1950, the UN General Assembly can, in fact, authorize forceful action by the United Nations. That's how the, United, the Korean police action was authorized. And not just that one. There were 12 others as well in the Congo, in Palestine, and so forth and so on. That's law. That's international law. And secondly, Chapter 8 of the UN Charter allows for regional action without UN uh, authorization. So if you have reporters who are willing and able to get in and report on uh, atrocities and so forth, there are other ways to act. And I actually think probably the most hopeful one is use of regional organizations. Did you want to come in? Oh, yeah. Next question. Over the press. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Stanton, the denial becomes even more powerful when it's in the uh, shape of a so-called academic printing and publishing like Justin McCarthy. Uh, there's also Bruce Fine and uh, somebody at Utah. So it's becoming more, appearing to be more legitimate. What, what can be done? I know uh, uh, denial cannot be uh, a crime in U.S., freedom of expression and all that thing. I'm involved with the uh, Swiss and Perinček case in the European Court of Human Rights. However, in terms of when it becomes academic, it's becoming more of a legitimate thing. What can be done in universities, either pressuring or... Uh, I would like to have your... Opinion. I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, when you get people with PhDs writing books that are essentially lying to, people, to other people, that the way Bruce Fine does and Justin McCarthy and these other people. It takes on a legitimacy. And then, get this, of course, they are paid to go around and speak. Not only that, the Turkish government creates professorships at uh, universities. Princeton has one, even. Uh, and guess who gets named to those professorships? Deniers who will deny the Armenian genocide. When that kind of thing happens, first of all, you've got to really hold uh, the administration of the universities uh, to the fire. You've got to say, look, if you really believe in academic freedom, 
You can't let the Turks determine who is going to hold that professorship. That's got to be done by the university, not by the Turks. And it doesn't involve political correctness, according to the Turks. Secondly, if you have people like McCarthy going around and giving his speeches, and, the, and of course the Turks pay for this, they, they spend millions on this every year, it's amazing, um, you have to um, basically protest and ask, you don't try to shut it down. I think one of the most effective demonstrations I heard of recently was uh, just held at the University of Toronto, in which, Toronto, yeah. yeah, where, I uh, you know, they, 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 they filled the room. And, and then a good, at least a half of the room, literally turned their backs on uh, these deniers. And uh, that's a pretty effective, but you know, not violent way of saying, we do not accept what you are trying to lie to us about. And then the other thing they did in Toronto, and I think it was very good, was they said, uh, University administration, will you let us put on a program that will tell the truth about the Armenian genocide? And of course, the university administration did. So I am, I'm a, not a fa uh, in favor of laws that outlaw denial because I do think that all it does is turn uh, the deniers into uh, free speech martyrs. Um, I can understand why Germany has such laws because, after all, they had to live through the Nazis. And I can understand why some other countries in Europe have such laws. Uh, but I don't think that it is in harmony with our First Amendment. And so I do think the best solution is the Jeffersonian one. You know, talk them down, basically. Because I think the truth ultimately will out. So we have time for one more question, but I ask that this one be for Dr. C. Uh, so. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, my, <clears throat> my name is Baris Arasoy. I'm a student at IWP, and I'm from Turkey. So I'm very familiar with the inner dynamics of genocide denial, because I lived through it after this. And I was wondering if you would agree that uh, the most effective way to uh, defeat, counter and defeat genocide denial in the long run would be to make it expensive for the Turkish government uh, or the administration to pursue this uh, narrative. Because I think that uh, Unfortunately, uh, genocide denial has become integral to the uh, national mythos of, of Turkish society. Whether you're a Kemalist or a leftist, or secular Islamist, uh, the idea that Anatolia is exclusively Turkish mm. uh, has become a, a norm. Mm. And people are indoctrinated as they grow up. Uh, but but you know, Erdogan is not an nationalist. He, uh, well. Uh, he despises the, the young Turks as much as he does the secularists. And, uh, you, have, you have to understand that the mass murder of the Armenians is the founding myth yes. of modern Turkey. It is also the last salvo of the old Ottoman Empire. So whether you are a, whether you are a national... <laughs> whether you are a nationalist whether you are a nationalist or a neo-Ottomanist, you can't touch the Armenian tragedy with impunity because then you would spit on your tradition and unravel the project that modern Turkey is. Exactly. And you, I can, you can say, well, from the point of view of history, most societies were um, uh, were uh, born in blood, and there is always crime and mass murder. If you look at the map of China, did you know that the the, the, the majority are Han people? If you look at linguistic evidence, the only uh, there are various dialects naturally, but most of mo most of um, uh, China's uh, linguistic tradition appears uniform. Well, it does because the Han people killed everybody else and assimilated the survivors. There are a, a, a few differences, for instance, the Liuchians. You know the Liuchu? Taiwanese. They're the indigenous people of Taiwan now, but they used to occupy a swath 
of southern China. That's why they feel themselves to be completely different from either the Kuomintang Chinese or the communist Chinese. It's like this almost anywhere in the world. It's, it's almost ridiculous that most people who deal with mass murder completely overlook Russia's conquest of Siberia. What we did to Native Americans was small fries in comparison because we were more or less discombobulated and there was no consistent policy and uh, emitting from first the colonial authorities then Washington DC those variation sometimes suppression sometimes ignoring Native Americans sometimes killing them and killings were localized as far as the Moscovites were concerned, once they went into uh, Siberia, it was extermination and exploitation. Nobody was left alone. There were expeditions, not to see cold cheese once in a blue moon. No, there were expeditions every other month to steal pelts. That's what paid for Moscovy's cannon. Pelts, pelts, sables. The Russians would, would, the Moscovites would steal children of the two goose. And you could have your child back if you give him three pel pelts of a squirrel. Or they'd kill the child. We did nothing like this to Native Americans. I'm not saying we were nice, better. No, no, no. This atrocity screams to heaven for a description, and there's barely any mention. Why? Because somehow we don't see. Moscovy Russia as the world's last remaining colonial empire, the world's largest contiguous empire based on conquest and blood. Instead in the West we tend to be self-lacerating. So the Turks are not the only ones. They should owe up. And what I was going to say is... Uh... And if Erdogan uh, wants to launch his neo-Ottomanist project, he can start with a clean state if he says, well, look, every empire, if it's successful, say like the Habsburg Empire, it agrees to put up with, pe the, with various people. And in fact, the more uh, relaxed the emperors or the imperial center and elite are about the human beings ruled by them, the more successful can an empire be and it can endure. Look how weak the Habsburg Empire was. Yet, it endured beyond anything imaginable with all the disparate people. The, however, the neo-Ottomanist project is a project of the caliphate. It's just like ISIS, it's just like Boko Haram, they would like to see a caliphate. That excludes everybody else. And they do not have in modernity a formula for neo dimi they don't have a formula. So that prevents them from uh, conceptualizing how to accommodate the Armenians. Also, if Turkey finally owes up, then Vilian will have to start paying me for waking up so early, because I hate to do so. He would get his property back. Yeah. Not to mention I'm about to petition Putin for the property Catherine the Great stole from my family when we were expropriated in 1772, and I'm still angry. <laughs> <laughs>